So last week we covered um, DDL. This week we're going to start diving into DML. This is where the meat and potatoes of SQL actually is. Um, as much as creating and maintaining the structure and inserting and updating records seems like a lot, it is stuff that is used a small percentage of the time compared to the select statement. Because you add stuff to a database, it happens occasionally. You read stuff out of the database, that happens all the time. Um, and the, I showed you guys this really quick at the end of last week's lecture, the select statement. Um, we are actually gonna spend the next couple of weeks on the select statement. It has a lot. This is my day job. This is what I do for a living, is this stuff. Um, well, that's not quite true, but close enough. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the main part of the SQL language that is most commonly used is the select statement. And there's what they call the select from and where framework, which is the three parts of the SQL statement. However, there's actually way more pieces to it than just that. However, there's three major pieces to it, which is select from and where. So select allows you to pick what you're gonna pull out of the database. From tells it which tables you're gonna pull it from. Where is where you're setting up your conditionals. So by now you guys probably learned about if statements in Java. Yeah, okay, good. We had one say yes really fast. And I had a bunch of people look confused. Um, so apparently at least one Java prof is on time. <laughs> The if statement is for conditionals, is to make decisions. SQL has something similar, it's its where clause. It actually has several places where you can do conditionals. And it is specifically in SQL, these conditionals are known as predicates. So you may see the word predicate show up at some point or other on the final exam. And a predicate is basically an expression that evaluates the true or false. Just like an if statement, is i greater than 10, true or false? Yeah, basically put it's Boolean logic and or it's this. So there's actually six parts. So the select from and where is what we're gonna concentrate on today. Uh, there's three other pieces that follow, which is group by, which has to do with aggregate functions. It's optional. Having, which is also optional. And order by, which is optional, which does sorting. And actually I'm gonna talk about order by probably at the end today. Uh, it's actually pretty quick to cover. Um, we'll be covering aggregates next week. Aggregates is math. Yes. Yes, that's two weeks from now. <laughs> I could have a six hour lecture or a two hour lecture. So, if we were to uh, break it down into a syntax-like uh, structure, it's like this. You go select. There's two keywords here that are both optional. All or distinct. If you don't include the word all or distinct, it defaults to all. So it just assumes you want everything. Uh, distinct is used to pull unique values. I'll do an example for you guys when I start doing some examples on the board or on the screen, I should say. Um, and then you list the columns you want. Uh, into new table, I'm not gonna talk about that right now, um, but that, that's where that goes if ever you're gonna use it. Uh, from, you list the table that you're gonna pull from, uh, where, the condition, group by, having an order by. The commands are in a very specific order. Whenever you write SQL, it is always in this order. Select comes first, then it's from, then it's where. If you're playing with aggregates, then you'll have group by and possibly having. And then order by comes at the end. There's actually one more keyword right after that that you can use, uh, which is limit. Limit basically says, you know, limit 10 means I only want 10 rows. I don't want all whatever you're giving back to me. So those are the six keywords. This is the order you write them in. If you try to do it in a different order, you're gonna get an error message. SQL is not smart. It doesn't try to be smart. 
It was designed to be verbose and structured. And that means you have to do it the way it expects you to do it. So in the field list, you have two options. You can use the asterisk, which means include all the available columns, or you can have a comma delimited list. And the two examples are there on the screen. You got select star or select ID comma name. Select star, which is really select asterisk, but some unknown reason we always call it select star. We'll just grab everything you're pulling back. Like if there's every available column will be coming. If you do it from a single table, it'll be just that list of columns. If you're actually doing a join, which I'll be talking about in a few weeks, it'll grab columns from all the tables. It's not great. Um, it's great when you're exploring the database and you don't know what's in it. It's really, really bad to do in practice or in production. You should only ever pull back what you need. Um, I think I covered that with you guys already, right? About the size of the pipe. Uh, if not, I'll be covering that in a moment. I'll explain that one right now. So the issue with select star is the size of the data you pull back gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Each character you pull back is one byte. And if you pull back a single record and it might be, I don't know, 512 bytes. You guys think that 512 bytes isn't big? And now we're going to pull back a million rows. That 512 bytes is suddenly uh, 52 megabytes. I'm really rounding really fast. I'm just not pulling out a calculator to give you the real numbers. But 52 megabytes, even you guys are still saying, ah, 52 megabytes isn't that big. It, sure, yeah, my phone, it's like four pictures. Well, not 10 pictures. 52 megabytes, right? Great. Now, there's pipes between the computers, right? Everybody's heard the meme about, you know, the internet is full of pipes. The really, it's a terrible analogy, but it's a really good analogy because the pipes can only take so much at once, right? When you pull the, the plug in your sink at home, the water just doesn't disappear. It slowly drains down the drain because the drain has a fixed capacity of how much water can pass through it. A connection from one machine to another machine has a fixed capacity of how much data can pass through it. And the fixed capacity is the fastest connection between point A and point B. Sorry, the slowest connection. So if somewhere in there, there's a link that's only 100 megabit, congratulations, you're gonna get 100 megabit. Doesn't make a difference if you've got fiber at both ends. It's going through a slow connection, it's gonna be slow because the pipe is small. So now we have our 50 megabytes and we're running a thousand of those a second. Now we're sitting at uh, five gigabytes a second of data being transferred. I mean, these are stupid numbers, but you know, even if a gigabit fiber connection isn't gonna handle that, it's gonna slow down. And every time it slows down, the next query is waiting to have its turn. The next query is waiting to have its turn. And then eventually it just backlogs until, you know, a query that would have taken one second to run might take 15 minutes to run because it has to wait its turn. It's just like when everybody's leaving, not everybody can get through the door at the same time. You've got to wait your turn. It's the same idea with this. So as a rule of thumb, in a production environment, you tend to want to just select the columns. So in my first example, we said it was 500 bytes. And the second one, let's say the ID is an integer. And then we have a name that's 50 characters at most. So an integer is usually um, one or two, it's usually less than a byte. Could be a couple of bytes, you know, up to, you know, eight bytes for an integer. And then you have the name, which could be 50 bytes. So suddenly you got 58 bytes instead of 500. It's an order of magnitude smaller of stuff being transmitted. So select star is great when you're exploring. It's great in development. You do not want to do that in production. All right, that's the pipe story. Production environment, as in live, people are using it for real. Development on your machine. Because you'll never notice performance bandwidth issues when it's on your machine because it's never leaving your machine. When it's sitting and on the inner, on a data center, often the database servers on one computer the web server, the application server is on a different computer. There might be multiple computers and they're all talking to each other across the backbone. 
And whatever speed that happens to be in the rack is the maximum speed you're going to have for transmitting data. You got to think about this stuff. Don't be a pig with your data. Pig. All right, so I'm actually going to run this command because you guys can't read it on the board. Um, it's literally this command here. Select star from customers. Um, I have 500 rows in this table. This is the, the one I gave you. You guys can actually pull down. Um, I really wish this would actually give me more data as in how much data was actually transmitted when I pulled this. Um, but that's what select star looks like. On the other hand, if I did select ID comma name, and what the heck? There we go. Customer ID and name. It is quick. What were you going to ask? MySQL Workbench being special. The word, the the word name is a reserved SQL keyword that nobody uses. It is part of the SQL standard, but nobody uses it, except for Oracle. But even then, you can't just use it. There's like special conditions to get at it. So it's a reserved keyword. That's why the word name is blue. It's just, this is also the only SQL editor I've seen that actually highlights the word name. Absolutely. It is a reserved keyword, but MySQL Workbench, it's a reserved keyword that's been reserved for like 30 years and nobody's done anything with it. They just reserve it because somebody said it somewhere along the way. We might, want, we might want to use the word name for something someday, so we're going to reserve it. And then everybody uses the word name as an actual column in their databases. So the SQL people are like, yeah, we're not even touching that. We don't need to have thousands upon thousands of angry customers. And these are the two examples, like literally what I just did. Okay, now the other cool thing is you can specify the order that the columns come back in. So I'm gonna throw in the word city in here too, just the, the key, the column city. And you can see there's my three. However, if I suddenly decided I want to have the city before the name, you will see that now the results come back in a different column. Realistically, when you're working in an application, this really doesn't do a whole lot. But if you're starting to work with uh, one of the topics I'll talk about later, like subqueries or um, you know, you're doing a bulk insert and whatnot, then the order of the columns makes a difference. So then you'll really care about changing the order of the columns. When you're working in an application, usually you run the query, the query object comes back, it gets converted into something called an array, which you guys will probably learn later in your Java class. And then, but that will actually determine the order of the columns in the array also. So, you know, you might care depending on what you're trying to do, but you can move things around and it costs nothing to do it. Like it's the exact same performance wise, regardless of where you put it. All right. So we're going to actually pull up the distinct keyword in a second here so you guys can see this. So I am going to just have the city and I'm going to run it. Again, you'll notice right at the bottom in really tiny little writing that it's returning 500 rows. If I slap in the distinct keyword and I run it again, you will notice now that it's returning 276. So the distinct keyword operates on the entirety of all the columns being returned. So it looks for, give me every unique combination of whatever is being returned. So if I'm returning two columns, so let's throw in uh, name and city. I'm back to 500. Why? Because there is no repetition in the combination of name and city of the two columns coming back. That's what distinct does. So distinct op looks at the entirety of all the columns here, and basically it grabs 
the entire row from left to right and compares the whole thing as a string to every other one being returned. And it will only give you the ones that are unique. So it'll give you the first copy of each one. There is a minor performance hit, obviously, because now it's got to do a bit of extra work, but you're transmitting less data back. So you're gaining it for what you're losing in performance at the beginning. You're gaining at transmission time because you're transmitting less data. So, no, no, it's distinct for, for the entire row. Now, when I start talking about aggregates, I will be talking that there is a uh, different mode for distinct when it comes to aggregates. Um, hopefully I don't forget to cover that. But you can, um, it allows you to do the math on distinct values instead of on the entire row. Uh, and here's the limit. I said I was going to talk about it before the end of the day. So there's limit. So let's just say I am, I limit five. Why would you want to do that? Um, there's a few reasons. Actually, I use limit all the time. Um, it's really handy with aggregates. If you're trying to find out what which one has the highest count or um, that kind of thing. If I want to... Yeah, let's just say I want to go order by name, which I'll be talking about by that, right? In descending order, and I want to limit to the first row. I want to know who has the last name in the database. That's what this is doing. It just pick. it only returns the very first row based on whatever is being returned by the, the outside query. So that's what limit does. So if you want to know the last five people in the database, that. Now, how would I use this in a production environment? I'd use it, for example, I want to know the last 10 orders that were just placed. So I'd sort and by by time that the order was placed in reverse order, limit to 10, it all would give me the 10 most recent orders. I don't even need to calculate dates. I don't need to play with time. I just say order by date in reverse order, which is descending, limit to 10, give me 10. So. SQL is really powerful when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, I abuse that system all the time. All right, so that is the select. That's the from, and we slipped in order by, uh, actually we didn't slip in order by, but I slipped it in by accident. Um, I'll be talking about order by later because there's actually planned for later, but order by got slipped in. Um, and we threw in limit. So. You know, we know we can limit how many rows get come back that come back. We know we can pick one or more columns, and we know where we can grab it from. All right, so this is where SQL gets complicated in the sense that we're talking about conditional statements, the where clause. In Java, you know this as your if statements. Uh, potentially your switch statement, depending, I don't know if you guys have gotten to switch statements yet or, or not, or case statements, uh, but you probably have experienced if. This is the same idea as an if statement. It's a series of Boolean expressions. We have several operators we can use. We actually have some that you don't have in Java. Um, we can have multiple clauses and I'll be covering how you handle those. And we also have, um, I don't know why they, Consistent on using the word brackets, it's parentheses. Brackets is the square ones. Parentheses are the ones that are like this. Um, yeah, anyways. Terminology is important to get it right. But often people just call it brackets when they're programming. Okay, so if we want to return specific, specified rows using the where clause. When the official standard for SQL for a literal string is a single quote mark. Some database engines let you use double quotes. MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server both allow you to use double quotes. Postgres, double quotes has a different meaning. It's used for something completely different. Single quotes, 
Single quotes is the standard. All database engines recognize it. So I will teach this course like double quotes do not even exist. Single quotes for a literal string. A literal string, just so you know, is a string that you're going to compare literally. It's, it's, a, it's a literal string because you're comparing it literally. Um, and depending on your database engine, it's even more literal than others. MySQL is slightly forgiving because it's case insensitive. It's very forgiving. But by the same token, it's a pain in the ass because then if you want to make things case sensitive, you have to use special operators. Other database engines such as Postgres is very case sensitive. It cares an awful lot. And if you want to make case insensitive, they made it case insensitive easily. They gave you an operator for it instead of having to use some weird uh, binary compare command. Um, also, when you use quote marks, you'll notice here there's a, a bunch of stuff that's underlined. But don't use the slanted one. But if you don't know which one the slanted one is, it's the one above the tab key. So if you look at your laptop, been sandwiched between the escape key and your tab key is another key. I'm laughing at her because she wants somebody to open up her computer. It's the same key as the tilde. You know the little squiggly line, the tilde? It's the one below the tilde. And what does it look like? It, it looks like this. Right? This is a quote. That's a slanted one, and it actually has an official name. Just so you know, it's known as a back tick. Back tick. Don't use the back tick. They are technically the same as far as MySQL is concerned. I do database servers care. Yes, Postgres uses that as an object identifier, which is what back ticks in MySQL do. So MySQL uses a back tick. Postgres uses double quotes. Microsoft SQL Server uses square brackets. They all have something slightly different to do that job. Or Oracle uses double quotes also, just like Postgres. If it's a string, single quote. End of story. Do not pass go. Okay, so I am going to go and grab all my customers. is equal to Ontario. So these, this is the, actually the examples in the slides. Um, what I'm doing here is it's saying I want the distinct name and city for customers where their region is equal to Ontario. Like I said, MySQL is not case sensitive. So I can type in Ontario like this and it will work. So we need to make an extra space like here? No. No, because it's a literal string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is going to say, give me everything that is space, O-N-T-A-R-I-O. -O. If I put another space, then it'll say anything that has a space in it. It cares. Now, if your space is on the outside, it couldn't give two shits. But if it's the quotes on the inside, it's a literal string. It will compare it literally. That's why it's called literal string. It has to be exact. So if I have this, which technically, you know, Ontario contains that, that will also not work. Why? Because I'm doing a literal compare. I want to know where the region is equal to N-T-A-R-I-O. Not, but if it's O-N, it's not going to be, it doesn't start with N, does it? It starts with O. So it's a literal string. It's looking for things that match exactly. That's what the equal operator, which, this is where your poor Java people are going to hurt because most of you are used to typing this. Yeah, no. It's this in, in SQL, single, single quote mark, a single uh, equal sign. That is the equality operator. We have the following operators. It's a good, it's a good thing it's all on one slide for you guys. So equal, you've seen it's equal to. You have the diamond operator, which 
is less than and greater than at the same time. Recently, by recently, you know, most of you guys were still in grade school. So it doesn't seem like, it seems like a long time ago for you guys. But for those of us that have been using SQL for 30 years, it's pretty recent. We finally got the, the bang operator, which is the not equal to used to seeing in Java. Yes. You know, exclamation mark is bang. Bang equal. Um, so the reason why the greater than, less than, the what we call the diamond operator works is it's impossible for something to be bigger than something else and smaller than something else at the same time. Therefore, it's saying anything that is not this value is allowed to go. So I will include the region on here to prove that this is working. So this, if I do this, I can go anything but Ontario, which will give me everything else. Or I can also use not equal to Ontario, and that will do give me the exact same result. So use whichever one you're more comfortable with. Uh, when I went through school, we only had the diamond operator. Less than, greater than, less than or equal, greater than or equal. This is also if you guys have seen in Java. Now, here are the ones that Java does not have. And I'm be demonstrating each of these. There's in and not in. In gives you a list. So you give it a list of values, it'll match them. Not in is give it everything that is not in this list. You have between and not between. So everything between a range of values and it includes the endpoints. So if you go between four and eight, it'll do four, five, six, seven, and eight. If you do not between, it'll give you one, two, three, nine. It does not include the endpoints. Well, a lot of people think, you know, oh, I want something that's not between these values. They, they'll type it in expecting that the end values are included. They're not. It's literally everything outside that range. Um, and then we got like and not like for pattern matching. We'll actually spend a bit of time on that today. And the following one is is null and is not null. This is the one that really throws C like programmers for a loop because in C like like you can go where a variable is equal to null or not equal to null. That's just the thing. The SQL language is actually really special. It actually interprets nulls the right way. It's impossible for null to be a value. Why is it possible for why is it impossible for null to be used as a value? It's the absence of value. It's an undefined value, therefore it can never be equal to null. Because by definition, it's impossible to be equal to null. It's also impossible to be not equal to null. So in SQL, they created a keyword called is. Is null? Is not null. Instead of saying, is this equal to null? We go, is this, is this null? So that it was more understandable. Yes. Who wouldn't? All right. So let's do the in clause. In is for a list. So this one's actually straightforward. I'll actually do the exact example that's in the slides. If I go in, in actual fact, I'll switch it out to uh, like this. And here we go. It gives me a list of the ones that are in those values. <clears throat> this list can be long, it can be short. It has to be in parentheses. It's common delimited. You can use a list of numbers. You can use a list of strings, list of dates, take your pick. They all are valid. You can have, you know, one, I mean, technically the in clause will work with just the one. In is more expensive than equal. Expensive as in it requires extra processing power to handle an in as opposed to an equal because an in it goes, oh, in it must be a list. So then it extantiates the list and then there's all the compares one at a time. When you're doing an equal, it doesn't need to extantiate the list because it's not a list. All right, so let me bring back Manitoba here and I'll demonstrate not in. 
not in this list. It'll give me everything but Ontario and Manitoba. So it's literally give me everything that is not in this list. So that's the in clause. There's really not much else to it than that. Um, here's another fun one. I was learning SQL. We didn't have the in operator. It really sucked. Um, we had to write it like this. Wait, it's coming. And so we also had to make sure it was treated as a single operator. So we slapped the whole thing in parentheses so that odd, so that everything inside those parentheses is treated as a single condition. Just like in math, you know, you always go from the inside parentheses out. SQL is the same way. So 1996, this is how we wrote the in. When, I, when they finally brought in, it was such a happy day in my world. Because it really sucked writing dynamic versions of this. Or, 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 or. So now I'm, I'm hitting up three regions. So it works the same. It's just kind of gross. Now, I'm going to continue with this before I get sidetracked with some of the other stuff. But that's, you know, the in list. And there's not in. I already did this one. Now, here's the end. So we can use the joy of math symbols. And I'm going to do this exact one. All right, and I'm going to run this. All right, so this is giving me everything that's greater than or equal to 100 and less than 200. Less than or equal to 200. And literally, that's what that is. This can be rewritten in a much easier to understand. So it's this funny thing is the human brain's an odd thing. Some people will understand this way better than the version I'm about to show you. Some other people prefer the other version. There's advantages to both. So we could go and that is the exact same thing as what was there before. So this will be uh whoops. Helps if your uh, column name is there. Where the total is between 100 and 200. And this will give us the exact same result. So you will now notice that with SQL, there's often more than one way to write the exact same thing. They've given us multiple ways. Now I got, are you asking a question? Then I'll, don't forget about you. A? Uh, the order by? Yeah, order by uh, defaults to ascending in smaller to smallest to biggest. Otherwise it defaults to descending biggest to smallest. Uh, it depends on your employer. Personally, I prefer, if it's literally going to be between a range and I need to include the values, I prefer between because it's more terse. It's, there's less code to read, right? So, like I said, this is exactly the same as this, but this is a little more reading. And the other issue with this is if you add another clause on here, like that, quantity greater than three, you have to take into account that it operates from what's, SQL is a strange language, it goes from left to right for everything. And even though right now you're seeing it as going top to bottom, it's really going left to right. So this is left, and it's literally reading the code as the cursor goes. So this 
comparison is to the left of this comparison is to the left of this comparison. And depending if you're mixing ands and ors and nots, the order that those are operated on is different. Like it, it, it completes certain operators before others. Like it'll do the ands before it does the ors. So if you're going to write it like this to get to you, back to you, you would have to also throw in some parentheses to make sure that it evaluates that as a single clause. And then it would do the quantity separately. Now, the only issue with this right now is between does not cover if you don't want to include 100 and 200. Because between will include 100 and 200. So depending on what your needs are, you will choose to use between or you'll use this approach. Either one is valid. They both work. They will both give you the same results. This one, you're probably better off throwing in parentheses in there just to make sure that it's treated as a single clause. Whereas between is treated as a single clause by default. And it all depends. Like most of the time in code review time, most companies don't care either way as long as it works. If you're working with someone who's really picky about how SQL is written, then you may have, you know, some rewriting to do. Performance wise, there is no difference between them. Like you will notice, I mean, maybe if you're operating across like 3 million, 4 million, 10 million rows, maybe there will be a small difference, but realistically, you'll never notice it. Which, you know, this is the example I just did. So the two versions of that. And the not between, actually, that's a good time to show not between. Now, you'll notice I'm not quoting my numbers. When you quote the numbers, which MySQL will let you do, and most database engines will let you do, you can do this, and it'll run more or less the same. However, this is called data coercion. Not, you're not casting, it's not a conversion. You are forcing the data type. And the database engine knows that total is actually a number. It sees strings. That means it needs to convert those strings into numbers. And then it does the comparison. You're adding extra steps. Some people will put quotes on everything because they're lazy. Right? They'll just slap quotes on everything because they're like, if I put quotes on everything, I won't forget to put quotes. He laughs. But it's true. I mean, when you're starting out, actually, I can't even say that. I've got a guy at work who's been working on databases um, almost as long as I have, and he quotes everything. It drives me up the wall when I because I'm, I'm the one that reviews code. And every time I see that, I'm like, why? Go fix it. I told you not to do this. It's like the 20,000th time I've told you not to do this. But he goes, it doesn't make a difference on the performance. I go, that's not the point. You do it right. Just because your car can run on regular gas or premium gas, if your car requires premium, you put the premium in it. Why? Because you do it right. So this is not between. So you will see that it includes everything that is not. Let me make the totals bigger here. You'll see that there's everything, but at one point it'll jump. Jump, hang on, we're almost there. Um, right there. 99.9, .9, it'll jump to 225. 220, now, some people are going to say, well, uh, between 100 and 200, technically 200.25 is not 200. It's bigger than 200. That's a number. Okay. So we have in as follows as an example between as a quick review. We have is null or is true. 
Uh, the issue is the database I use as an example doesn't have any null columns. So I, I can't demonstrate that very easily. Um, I think the one you guys are using for lab seven. Select a star from airports. This the database you guys are using for that lab for lab seven. I'm just trying to see if there's any in here with nulls. Uh, not looking good. Okay, let's go look at airlines. Oh, there we go. Why is something null? Because you need to know if the value has been set or not. Sometimes when you, like I said before, Booleans in database are actually trinary Booleans. It can be true, can be false, and if you allow nulls, it could be null. So it is yes, no, I don't know. The first thing is you need to know when people don't know. So if you don't know what the value is and you need to check for it, there it is. So if I go here, uh, where country ID is null, it'll give me everything where the country ID is null. If I turn it around and go is not null, it gives me everything that has a country ID and ignores anything that, that is null. So that's literally the null operator. So either it is null or it is not null, which is actually really easy to read compared to like the Java way where you're saying, well, is variable A equal to null? Right, to go if A equal equal null. But the problem is with that is some languages have more than one kind of equality operator. For example, uh, PHP has uh, three different equality operators. That's equal equal, which is, is it the same? Equal, equal, equal. Is it identical? And then there's another one called the UFO operator. Yeah, so is it equal to this or is it bigger or smaller? UFO. That's what it's called. It's called the UFO operator. Um, so, you know, at least SQL makes the whole null thing easy to understand when you write it because it's written like a sentence. Like, is it null or is it not null? Okay. The next one is our pattern operators. The keyword is like. So this is one where people often when they're doing lab seven, where there's a couple of questions there to ask you about matching certain patterns. That's the keyword you're going to use. It's like. And there are two um, wildcard characters. So you basically put when you're trying to match a pattern. Now, the stupid thing is the human brain is really, really good at matching patterns. Computers are really, really bad at pattern recognition. They're just terrible at pattern recognition. So we have to tell them, how do we want to match this? So we have two things. You can go have your conversation out in the hall because you're actually echoing off the board and they're completely ignoring me. There we go. If I can hear your voices bouncing off the board, you're talking too loud. All right, so you got two. You got the underscore operator and the percent sign. Underscore will match a single character once. So that means that if you want to say anything that starts with any letter, and then the next two letters is A and D, you go underscore A and D. It'll go anything, one time, A and D. We have the percent sign operator, which is the one, which is zero or more characters until you find the following characters. I will demonstrate those because it, when you hear it, it makes no sense. But when you see it, it'll make all kinds of sense. Let's go back to my original table I was using. Go select star from customers. Actually, no, you know what? I'm just going to play with names. Name, and I think I got postal code in there, don't I? Oh, do I not have postal codes? Postal zip. Hmm. All right, so here's our postal codes. Now we can actually say where um, 
let's go name like oh hang on we need that in quote marks and it'll match Kirsten Moore essentially it's saying is give me anything that ends in this it's really handy if you are trying to literally match one specific thing for for example we have certain postal codes right so we don't we want anything that starts with k and we don't care about the next two letters and we don't care about the rest well, actually that's a really stupid way to write this uh hang on that's that one here let's try that uh, and that's postal zip so you could write it like this this is actually a really dumb way to write it, by the way, but I'm just using that as an example. And essentially what this is going to do is going to say anything that starts with K, I don't care about the next two characters. There must be a space, one space and only one space, and then I don't care about the rest. So the underscore operator is not used all that often. The percent sign one, on the other hand, is used extensively. Because I could rewrite this like that. And this will give me basically the same results, right? Anything that starts with K. But now what's cool with this one, though, I could also say I want everything in K that is also 6T, and I don't care about the rest. So then that'll give me anything that starts with K that then has 6T somewhere in its postal code and anything else afterwards. This will actually be easier to see when I play with people's names. So I'm going to nuke this, bring that back so I have ideas for my match. All right, excellent. So we go where, name, like. I want everybody whose names starts with W. So anything that starts with W and it doesn't care at all what's after that. It could be zero or more characters. So could just be W. Could be W-I or W-E. Could be, you know, uh, Win Whitney, which is actually the third one from the top. So if I run this one, it'll give you everything that started with W. It works. So let's just say we're not sure about how Win is spelled. Um, so we're not sure about that, but we know there's a couple of Ns and an E. We don't know if it's W I or W Y. So we're going to run it like this. So this will give me anything that starts to W, has any number of characters, including N and E, and then a percent sign. And let's see what this gives us, which actually works out for this one fairly well. Uh, on the other hand, I could also say I want anything that has just the W, then an N E. Oh, that's still not a good example. All right. Starts with W. As long as there's an E somewhere else in the string, it will be, it'll match it. So if we look at the first row, we have Wind Whitney, so we have two E's. Uh, Wilhelmina Stanton was picked up because it's W, then there's an E further down in the person's name. Um, Winifred Molzer, which is further down, was picked up also because there's an E in both names. It's cool. It's just a bunch of names, right? And it's pattern matching. Uh, let's say I want to know anybody who ends in uh, EY. I could go percent sign EY, and that will give me, I don't care until you hit EY, and there's no more wild cards after the Y. That means the string must end in EY. So if I run this, we have all the strings that end in EY. Now this kind of pattern matching is handy if you're you're not sure about spelling for things or you're trying to match certain kinds of postal codes. Um, like, like if you want to know, a common one you'd see is anything that is, you know, in Eastern Ontario, which would give you this. Or if we want to know a specific part of Eastern Ontario, would give you this. Okay? Yeah, it'll be postal zip in this case. 
The limitations on using the like operator is zero MIPS. It helps if you type it in right. And there it is. And I don't have any K2s, so it doesn't match. The limitations on using these wildcards is basically your imagination and your understanding of the data that's behind the scenes. Sometimes you'll just have certain cases where no matter what you do, the pattern's just not going to work. So then you'll end up using multiple like clauses so that you can say anything starts with these letters and has these letters somewhere else and it has that. I've had to do that once or twice. It's not pleasant. Uh, it's not something you do on a regular basis. Um, usually you'll use this when you're uh, handling people's searches. So, you know, you have a search box in your application and they type in some criteria. That's, you know, where that would get used is this kind of stuff. Yeah. You escape it. Same way you escape strings in Java, you escape strings in this. So you, yeah, you escape it, the backslash. That's what it's called, escape. Well, right now I'll get nothing. Um, because I don't have percent signs anywhere in anything. So that's an interesting question. Uh, and you can also match for the underscore the same way you escape it. Now, different database engines will do this slightly differently, so your mileage may vary. So if you need to search for a percent sign or you need to search for an underscore, double check the documentation for whatever database engine you're working on. Because I know that in Postgres, that's not how you escape things. Um, but that was a good question. Actually, I think you're the first student that's ever asked that question. There's always somebody new every term that comes up with something I haven't heard before. All right, so this actually has a bunch of examples showing the exact same thing. Um, yeah, just more examples of what I just finished doing. Um, and here's the is null, is not null. I already demonstrated that. So as you can see, I'm skipping through some of these slides now because I did the demos as part of what I was doing instead of that. Okay, dates. Now I'm only the I'm probably the only prof that has an updated slide on dates, um, because dates in SQL suck. Actually, let me phrase that: dates suck in all computing. It is the hardest data type to work with, bar none. It is so stupid to work with, and databases make it extra special. Dates in SQL are treated like strings. They look like strings. They smell like strings. They're not strings. Dates as a whole is easy. If you're just doing a date, so March 14th, 2023, that's easy. Time. Time is bad because of how database servers handle time. If you are querying a field that is a date only field, great, no problem, it's easy. If you're querying a database field that has a time component, everything just got complicated. Because it's just like a number. 225 is bigger than 200. Therefore, 2 a.m. is bigger than 1 a.m. And Often when you're doing transactions, there's date and times involved. And then you got this problem where you have a range. So if you do not include the date portion, I mean the time portion, it defaults to midnight, zero, 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 which is cool, um, except you end up having to uh, do it a few different ways. and. I will demonstrate these because I, when I made this database, I made a point to set up the data so that I could demonstrate this. You will notice if you look at the order date that there's a bunch of dates. Now, let's just say I want to go where order, no, order date. Oh, come on, Dan. 2022-04-15. All right. 
I want to know all the orders on April 15th. And we will get nothing. Why? Because, no, you can't use wildcards. It's looking for this. This is why I said dates suck. Date time sucks. So if you want to know everything that happened on the, on the 15th, there's two ways of handling this issue. You can choose to go greater than or equal. And actually, I'm putting that wrong. Greater than or equal. Got to write it the way you say it. And order date less than or equal to. Actually, it's just do less than, just in case it's an order at midnight on the 16th. And now we've got our orders from the 15th. Why does this work? It's because it's saying, and actually, technically, if we really want to be precise, it's actually doing that. But, you know, for the human brain, this is more than understandable. That's what it's doing when you're dealing with date time. It assumes midnight. Therefore, 014647 is not 00000. zero, 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 zero. Therefore, well, if you do an equal to that, it will not work. So you have to use a range. You could write this as a between clause also, which some people will find this significantly easier to understand. The only danger is that if you just so happen to have an order that happened at midnight, it would get included. Just, you know, saying. Um, never assume that it never, it's impossible because it will happen. The second you assume it can't happen, it will happen. Murphy's Law would state. Uh, if you don't know what Murphy's Law is, is whatever can go wrong will go wrong and usually in the most spectacular fashion. Uh, that's That's the second clause of Murphy's Law. Okay. So that is date and time. The other way of doing it, and I actually have to go look this up because I can never remember what it is in MySQL, is casting it. So uh, MySQL cast date. Cast as date, stack overflow. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I like that, there we go. So the other choice we have is we can go cast as date. like that, and that will give us the same result. So in this case, what the casting is doing is it's taking the date time, it converts it to a date by dropping the time. Yes, I do use this before you go and ask. Yes, I use this all the time because I'm, I deal with business systems. I deal with money and numbers. Therefore, dates are very important in my world. You cast it as time. For for the time? Yeah, you can. Uh, oh, I mean, if you want to say uh, all the orders are placed between certain hours on a certain date. Yeah, you could. I could go, um, if I go order date greater than uh, everything was placed after 9 a.m. I could do this, and that will give me, well, actually, that's not quite true. It's everything that's bigger than that, which means anything on the twenty on the 16th will all 17th, 18th, 19th will be included too. So we end up having to go come on. Yeah, I picked the wrong. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There's your two. So you can compare time too. So you can do date and time. In theory, you could cast as a time, but then it would ignore the date. So it would give you anything that was placed at that time, regardless of the day. So you can play with the date time stuff a lot. There's all kinds of things you can do with it. Um, 
But this is the most important thing to remember is that dates, number one, dates suck. Two, if you're working with date time, always assume it's going to pick midnight. Therefore, either cast it to a date if you need to compare just the date part or use a range. With date and time, it's always a range. There's no such thing as you know, this exact value, unless you know exactly the time you're after. And the database we use at work, we use Postgres at my day job, it tracks times down to the microsecond for every transaction. That's just its default behavior. So I could literally go like this, but it's also comparing these numbers. So you have to be careful with depending on what your database engine is capable of. All right, so that's date time. Um, yeah, because the database engine we use at my day job, we casting is done completely different. So that's why I had to go double check the syntax because I can never remember from my SQL. All right, now here's a series of examples on using date. Here's how you cast a date. I just literally did it. And if I'd remembered that I'd added this slide, I wouldn't have needed to go to Google to find the answer. <laughs> Um, using numbers. Numbers are straightforward. I've actually shown you guys using numbers when I was doing the, the order total. So I'm not even going to bother going through those few slides. Um, obviously, you can use column names in the SQL clause because that's literally how you do it. Um, I don't even need to do this example. Um, the only thing about the column name in a, in the where clause is you do not need to include it in your select statement. So by that I mean, if I go back to here and I go just the order ID, I think my shift key's sticky. Do you notice every time I do the underscore, the next letter stays uppercase? Mm. You'll notice that I am searching against the order date but I'm not including it in the results. Things in the where clause do not need to be included in your select your selection of columns. It's not necessary. You include it if you want it, especially if you're trying to make sure you're right. But in product in the real world, you'll get to the point where you don't necessarily need to pull all those things out. It's just not necessary. Now, one of the last items we're going to cover today is as, and I'm going to make a point, to, I think that we're, this is one of the last slides, uh, but I'm also going to make sure I go through the order by a little bit for you guys to make sure that's clear. Aliases allow you to rename objects temporarily. It's only for the duration of the query. An alias used in normal English means it's an alternative name. It could be a nickname. It could be uh, a person's, you know, some people have na complicated names and they'd rather be known uh, with their short name. So their alias is their short name. In database, we can rename objects temporarily. Um, yeah. So for example, uh, actually I'll use this order one as a good example. Um, so I got my order ID. It comes back as order ID. In theory, let's just say I'm actually writing this as a report for a manager. And this is what's really special about SQL. When SQL was originally created, it was meant to be used by managers. And if anybody in here has ever had a manager, you know exactly what the problem is. <laughs> she starts chuckling. I can guarantee my manager at my day job could not have SQL his way out of a paper bag. Dude was brilliant. His math skills were astonishing. SQL, I might have been, might as well have been speaking Cantonese to him. It was a totally different language. He had no idea. No idea. So, but it was written originally for managers. That's why it's so English. Really, that's why it was written that way. I kid you not. Helps if you close your quotes properly. And now you will notice that it renamed my column to order ID. So 
you can rename all your columns. The funny thing is, is now those columns are actually renamed. You can actually refer to them by their alias elsewhere in the query. Um, you can rename tables, which when I start talking about joins in two weeks, the whole alias thing will come home to roost at that point. Um, when way back in the day, when we were writing queries and reports were run and sent to a line printer. Now, most of you in here probably don't know what a line printer is, but we had, when we submitted our work, screenshots weren't a thing. We sent the print job to the line printer and it was a race on who was gonna to get to the line printer first because we had one for classroom. Line printers are these huge printers. They're like that wide and they're really, really loud and they just feed out of a box and it's here go nonstop, right? When back in the day when SQL was first coming out, people were writing queries for reports and they were set up to run on scheduled jobs and we could actually redirect the output of the query straight to the printer so that the nightly reports would print automatically based on the query. So now, of course, we didn't want the managers to have to understand what the column names are, so we would rewrite them so the column names would match what they're expecting. So if I turn this around, I go grab my order lines table. Like this. Okay, most of this, is understandable. Suddenly you got the order line ID, the order ID. Then it just says list. Who knows why it says list? I don't remember why I called that column list. It actually wasn't supposed to be a list. I was just lazy and I never bothered to rename it. So this would actually get written like this. So if we were going to write this to make it nice for someone to understand, we go order ID as order ID, comma, list as product, uh, cost as price, quantity, because, you know, we've got to save room now, why can I not type today? Yeah, something sticky. So if I run it like this, now you'll see these nice headers. Totally useless on the programming side. So if you're going to pull this into like Java, it would be a nightmare to work with because each of the array elements are not going to have spaces in them and special characters and stuff. But if you are trying to run it to export this, in actual fact, I did something similar to this just two days ago. Would have been on Friday, I guess now, two days ago, two business days ago, where I needed to export some data for... Um, somebody in our sales department and they wanted a CSV file. What they really wanted was an Excel spreadsheet, but they asked for a CSV file. And then I sent it to them. They go, well, can you rename the columns? Cause I don't know what they are. That's what I did. Cause then in theory, I could export this. I'm going to send that to my desktop. <laughs> Just like this. So I saved that as a CSV. And now if I open this in Excel, and there it is, in a format that's understandable by a manager. Yes, there's advantages to rename your columns in an SQL statement when you're trying to get data out of a database in a way that you don't want to write a program to do it. Yes, I could write a program to do this in Python or PHP or Perl or God forbid, you know, Java or C. Not Java because I haven't touched Java in 20 years. But, you know, yes, it could be done in insert preferred programming language here. But why bother if it's a one-time job? If you can make it look nice right off the bat, that's great. Okay, so. Well, the, the, in this case, it does make a difference because they're all treated as strings. In Postgres, if I was using Postgres, everything would have to be double quotes. So it, at this point, it really does make a difference. They're both strings. Oh, it's when it's an array element, because when you pull it as an array, this the column names become the keys for the array. When you learn about arrays, it'll make more sense. You're just not having learned about arrays yet. But you'll be referring 
to the array element by that string and it's case sensitive and their spaces and because Java cares about uppercase, lowercase, cares about spaces, right? So you tend to not want to mess with that too much. Another use for the alias is if you are dealing with an old system and there's been some upgrades done. So the database structure has changed, but the old applications expect things to look as if you named a certain way. You could use an alias to rename things so they still look the same as they did in the old system. Yes, I've had to do that too. Uh, I try not to, but yes, it has happened in my world. And that's more alias and more examples of aliases. Uh, here's an example where, you know, the bottom one, it's using a function called concat, which is concatenate. You guys have learned about concatenate yet in Java? Take string A, glue it to string B. I think in Java, it's a, it's a plus sign. You take string A plus string B gives you longer string. In SQL, it's called concatenation. And MySQL specifically has a concat operator to concatenate strings. Uh, this is just different things you can do with aliases. And I'm just going to talk about order by really quick uh, before everybody gets too excited and leaves. Um, okay, so order by, I can go order by quantity, ascending. So that'll go from smallest to biggest. And it's not quantity like that, it's quantity, because that's I literally wrote the word. Quantity, ascending. DESC for descending. If you don't include it, it defaults to ascending because it just assumes you want it alphabetical. You can also sort by multiple columns. So if I want to go quantity, ascending, total, actually let's go quantity descending, total ascending, it'll first sort by quantity and then by the total. So it'll sort it all first by the quantity, and then it'll do a subsort on the second one. You can do three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, call them as many as you want. Makes no difference. It just allows you to sort by multiple things. This is often used when you are trying to make sure that data comes out a certain way. So you run a report, and they want the results to be ordered by country, region, and then alphabetically by name. So you'd go, actually, I think I can even do it in this one here. Hang on, select, select star from customers, order by country, comma, region, comma, name. And that will sort alphabetically by country, and then by region, and then by name. So it'll be, Canada is first in this list because Canada happens to be the first country alphabetically in this my sample data. Region was Alberta first because Alberta alphabetically in Canada comes first. And then it's by name. So you'll see that we got Bell Yates and then Brittany Houston and Carissa Townsend. These are all in Alberta. And if we scroll down through this list, you will see eventually that now we got British Columbia because B comes after A. We're still in Canada. And eventually we keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Now we got United States. Because United U comes after C. That's literally all there is to order by. It. So this is actually a common kind of report that we'd run. Like if we're trying to get, um, we're trying to dump out reports for our sales reps and they need to follow up on certain pieces of information. We will often dump it by country so that we, so they when they distribute the list they say okay well, you know Rick's is is in is in charge of Europe. So Rick's going to talk to the European people. Dave is in charge of Canada. So that kind of thing. It'll sort country first. And then after it's done sorting the country, it'll subsort the results a second time by region. And then it'll sort it a third time by name. So in theory, It'll be A to Z, actually technically zero to Z, because zero comes before A. Um, and depending on your database engine, lowercase a comes before uppercase a. MySQL doesn't care. But if you're using Oracle or Postgres, it cares about case. 
and it also depends on what's called the collation for your table. Uh, you can set how, how the sorting rules are based on how you create the table. We don't touch that in this course, so that's really overcomplicated, and every database engine does it different. But you can tell it by default, this collation mode says, okay, ignore the case or don't ignore the case. It always sorts alphabetically, smallest to biggest by default. So for example, I can show that I can sort the country alphabetically, A to Z, region Z to A, and then a name A to Z. So if I run it like this, now we got Yukon first, but it's still Canada first, but we got Yukon first, and then we got name alphabetical. So you can mix match your ascending descending operators in there, no problem. It's whatever you want. And it works. So as you notice, so far SQL is very flexible. It will always do exactly what you tell it to do. Might not be what you want it to do. And it's not obvious sometimes that you didn't get exactly what you're expecting. Because sometimes you don't know what the data looks like, right? So, and before anybody asks, how, how do you get better? I'll give you three guesses. How do you get better writing SQL? You write SQL and just come up with scenarios. Like I was making stuff up as I was going through the lecture, going, oh, we'll sort like this, we'll sort like that. Take a look at the sample databases that you're given. Um, the order sample is a small database, three tables, 500 rows, you know, then it's like a thousand and like 15 like 10,000 rows or something like that. Um, the other one you have starting for lab seven is flight DB. Flight DB is really cool um, because it's real data. Um, there was a web service called Flight Aware. Flight Aware still exists, but at one point they used to publish their data. And I downloaded a snapshot and then restructured it so that it was usable by students. It is real airlines, real airports with real coordinates, real altitudes, real routes between airports as of whatever year I did this database, which was probably seven or eight years ago. So this was literally, you could actually see what flights left from Toronto Pearson for Air Canada going to Madrid. You could actually write a query and actually see what the flight number was. You wouldn't know the time, it doesn't have the times, that kind of stuff, but you could actually, you'd know, it's, it's real data, it's real world data that was expected out of a site when they used to give you the stuff for free, which is really cool. So. The queries you're going to be doing in FlightDB is you're playing with real world data, which is so much better than playing with some of the sample databases that MySQL includes, like Sequila and the World Database, which is very offensive. Um, the World Database sample is very offensive to many people. Just go explore the data and it, if it go free, feel free to go explore. Um, it uses um, it includes countries that do no longer exist. It refers to certain kinds of people by names that are no longer acceptable. Then it's, it's politically incorrect. Certain um, Aborigines and certain countries are referred to by their old names that are not acceptable by today's standards, which I will not ever be recorded saying. So the world database is bad. So the flight DB is really good for you guys because it's real data, completely realistic data as supplied by a provider. So it takes a little while getting used to it. That's why there's a diagram. Please familiarize yourselves with the diagram. Um, actual fact, I will point out two things that actually cause people some grief, uh, specifically in flight DB. Um, it is specifically the roots table. In the flight DB, you will notice that <clears throat> there'll be some questions in lab nine, more than any of the others, that say, I want you to give me all the routes that leave Toronto Airport or departs Toronto Airport. And then they go, well, I don't see anything that says leaves or departs. There are two columns, which are gonna be really small on the screen, but you'll see source airport ID and destination airport ID. Source airport ID is where the plane takes off. Destination airport is where it lands. Therefore, if it's leaving Toronto, it's the source ID is Toronto. The destination is wherever it lands. Sometimes you'll actually have somewhere the source, there's only a source, there's no destination. That's because it's a flight that takes off from one airport and lands again at the same airport. 
And some people are going, what kind of what flight is that? Recon flights, tourist flights. So these are play, they're flights that take off from the airport. They do like a tour around the air and they land again. There are actually scheduled flights that do that. Uh, sky jumping flights, you know, parachute flights. They, they're scheduled to take off from specific airports. They have a specific pattern and they come back down to the same airport. So there's some weird stuff in that database that might not be obvious when you first think about it. But the one that trips up the most students in this database is the source airport ID and the destination airport ID because people have a hard time grasping that source means take off, destination means land. Right? Source goes this way, destination goes that way. Not this way, that way. So that is that. So you guys have everything you need to do lab seven. I know, Alem's missing an action for three quarters of this group. Your prof is um, hurt his back and is in apparently a lot of pain. As a person who hurt his back years ago, I can sympathize. Uh, back pain is a terrible pain. Um, so, yeah. So you guys have everything you need for lab seven. Next week, I uh, will be continuing with more SQL. We'll be dealing with something called aggregate functions, which is doing math. And I'll also be talking about assignment two. Actually, as of today, you guys have enough to do three quarters of assignment two now. About three quarters of assignment two. So the next couple of weeks to give you the rest. You're almost there. Try that again. Uh...